Good evening and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. I'm so glad that you tuned in this evening. My name is Andrea Giudice and I am your host and I actually get to be the guest tonight as well. And I have with me my guide dog who as always, I'm not introducing by name and that is for his focus and our safety as a team when we're guiding so that no one remembers his name and uses it at an inappropriate or inopportune moment. This is one in a series that I've been doing called Person and Pup to Partners. I'm very excited about this series. And it's talking about how does a little adorable puppy like we saw in the very first episode with Ian who was 10 weeks old and me, uh, a, or any blind person who wants to get a guide dog, how do those two paths come together to make a, a partnership between a, a person and a dog? So far, we've talked about how puppies get raised and the people that do that. And we've talked with an O&M mobility instructor about how to prepare from a orientation and mobility perspective to get a guide dog. And we've talked with a guide dog instructor who's taught us a little bit about how the dog gets trained. So the next step in this process is how does the person get ready to go to, to, to go and actually go to class and get a guide dog or have a trainer come to their home and train them with a guide dog. And I thought about who I could bring in because I'm always looking for experts in this, in any field that I talk about. And while I'm certainly not an expert, I have a lot of experience in getting ready to go to guide dog school. So I decided to interview myself. Plus I really had fun doing this in January and February. So I thought, well, if I enjoyed it then, I probably enjoy it again. Once the decision has been made to get a guide dog, and a person has been interviewed by the school. The process typically involves a, an in-person interview where a representative from a guide dog program will come and talk to you about your lifestyle and the things that you are going to do in your life, what kind of work and play and volunteerism that you have. What is the environment the dog's gonna live in? Do you live by yourself? Do you have five cats? Do you have 40 goats and two chickens? What is the environment that the dog will live in? And then what is the type of environment that you work in? Do you work in a city? Do you, are you in college and your dog is gonna have a very erratic schedule? Are you someone who goes to an office every day and so for big chunks of the day your dog will be inactive? These are all very important things for a guide dog school to know about you so that they can start to do the matchmaking process that brings the correct dog together with any given person. So that's what the first step is so you fill out your application, you have your home interview, you, um, the, the, the school determines that you are eligible, that you meet the criteria on all different levels. And now you have found out you're getting a dog and it's time to get yourself emotionally ready for that. And not only yourself, but your family too. I am with my guide dog number six. So I've done this six times now. There are people who've done it many more times and there are people who haven't done it that many times yet. But I think that there are some very consistent things that people feel and experience and wonder about as they're preparing for this, this time between you get the letter saying you're accepted and the phone call saying you're accepted and the day you, you go to guide dog school or the, the trainer shows up at your house with the guide dog. One of the most important things that I tell people when I am talking to them about whether or not a guide dog is the right choice for them is that it's not just about having a dog that goes everywhere with you. And many, many people like dogs. And so they think, oh, that'd be so cool. And I think I've mentioned this in other shows that I also thought the first time I got my first guide dog that I wouldn't have to be a participant, that I would hold onto the harness handle and simply sort of be an anchor the dog would sort of drag along behind them and they would do everything, all the thinking, all the decision-making. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I won't have to think about anything. I won't have to know where I'm going or have a map in my head or anything like that. And it doesn't matter where I am in the whole country. If I want to go to Dunkin' Donuts, off I go. If I want to go to Cumberland Farms, I just say to the dog, find Cumberland Farms. It doesn't matter if we're in Simsbury or West Hartford or if we're in you know, Topeka, Kansas. The dog's just going to know, magically know where Cumberland Farms is. Um, and so these are some things that I explain to people when they are considering whether a guide dog is the right choice for them. Working with a guide dog is very definitely a partnership. I still need to know where I'm going and how to get there because my dog is the pilot and I'm the navigator. So my dog is relying on me to give instruction as to when to turn right and left 
and to do that, I need to be able to know how many blocks I need to walk before I make a right or a left, how many times I need to turn before I get to any given destination. So, so if you will, picture in your mind a set of written directions that say, walk three blocks, cross the street, turn left, cross the street again, walk one more block, turn right, walk two blocks, turn left, walk three blocks, and the and cross the street. And once you've crossed the street, the, the destination you're looking for will be about halfway down the block on your right. That's what I need to be able to say to my dog. As we go along our path, each step as we cross streets, as we come to intersections, I need to know what to do. And I need to communicate to that to him so that he can then guide me safely through that environment, avoiding obstacles and stopping at changes in elevation and all the things that we've talked about that guide dogs do. So for anybody who's looking for a way to not have to think or participate, a guide dog is not a good option because you do absolutely have to do that. In fact, I don't really think there's anything that involves no thinking, but if there is, a guide dog isn't it. Another thing that sometimes happens for people is that they're used to having a cane and a cane is a very, very useful tool, but it's a very inanimate object. So when I, if you, if I had, when I had my cane, I get home from work or school and the cane can just go in the corner and do its thing. And there's, I, it, it requires nothing else from me, except when I'm actively using it to sweep in front of me to help me understand what's in, in, in my path, the cane has no need from me. When I get home from a long day at, the, at, at work and I'm tired, my guide dog, on the other hand, is all wound up and ready to play because while I've been busily doing my work, he's been quietly sleeping under my desk. And so he is all ready to be active and playful at the end of a day. When I am um, in college and I have studied all night and I'm exhausted from exams, my dog still needs to go out first thing in the morning and get fed. And when it's snowing and when it's cold and when it's raining, so a guide dog is more than just a mobility choice, it's a lifestyle choice. And so when people are thinking about this, getting a guide dog, this is a really important thing to think about, is that I am making a lifestyle choice because I'm making a choice to not only have a guide dog as a mobility aid, but also to have a guide dog that I'm responsible for. So I need to make sure that I'm willing and able and ready to put that guide dog's needs before my own and to know that it is not going to be able to just get up and get its own breakfast if my night has been too rough. It is not going to be able to give itself the exercise it needs if I'm too tired at the end of the day. So that's, it. that's a really important thing. Another thing that I think is interesting and people may not realize is that unlike a family pet where perhaps the person who gets home first or the person who's just in the mood to that night takes care of the, of the family pet, the family dog, a guide dog is exclusively the responsibility of the person to whom it is issued. So even when I was at home in my, with my first guide dog in my senior year of high school, and even though we had a family dog, and I might or might not have had a, you know, taken responsibility for feeding that family dog every now and then, the guide dog was completely my responsibility. So I feed the dog, I take the dog out, I groom the dog. That's all a, the, the responsibility of the person who's issued the dog. So unless there's something extreme, like you're in the hospital, you're very, very sick, the guide dog is a one person responsibility. And I, I think for a lot of people, that's a new experience because if you've ever been in a family unit that's had an animal, especially a dog, that, that tends to be sort of a family affair, not so much with a guide dog. So that's one of the things that people need to sort of think about when they're, when they're deciding whether this is the right thing. Something that has been I've talked to a lot of people about, and, and I think it's very, very interesting, is that sometimes someone will say to me, well, I really want a guide dog, but my family is really resistant to my getting a guide dog, and I really don't understand why, because, you know, it's a really good thing, and I can be really independent. When I sit down with that person and we talk about it a little bit more, what I realize and what they realize is that it's not that the family doesn't want them to be independent, but that if you're family, your parents, your husband or wife, your boyfriend or girlfriend have always been the person who has been your sighted guide. So whenever you go out, you're holding their arm. They're, they're the one who's really performing that task. 
sometimes the introduction of a guide dog can feel like a threat. So if this person gets a guide dog, what will my role be? If, the, if they're always going to have their guide dog, so they're going to be all kinds of independent, and when we go out to the grocery store and we go out shopping and we go out to dinner, what will my role be now that they have the guide dog? They won't need me. And of course, this is absolutely not true. Anybody who has a guide dog still often will use sighted guide holding on to the arm of someone they're with or holding hands with someone. Um, but I think that for the people who are the immediate family and loved ones of someone who's getting a guide dog, it's not just, the, it's not just a new experience for the person receiving the guide dog. It's also really a new experience and a life-changing aspect for all the people who are immediately in their world. And it can be helpful to have conversations about that and just say, you know, I, I want to make sure that you know I'm not replacing you or your importance in my world with this guide dog. And yes, we absolutely can go out and take walks holding hands on the beach. And yes, when we go out to dinner, you know, if, if you, if, you know, I, I, it's not that I will never hold your arm again or you'll never be giving me assistance. It will just be different because now I'll have the guide dog to, to help me. But I, I, I know that for some people, it feels sort of like a threat that that guide dog is going to come along and all of a sudden their role has completely been um, subjugated by the guide dog. So that's something to, to think about and to talk about with your family and your loved ones as you're getting ready to go to guide dog school is I want to make sure that you realize that this is going to be different, but it's not going to be bad and I'm not replacing you with something that has a wet nose and a waggy tail. I'm just, I'm just adding to the experience. It's interesting too to think about that in guide dog, when you go to guide dog school or when you're training with a guide dog, there's so much to learn. And so when you fill out the application, it will say, well, you have to be able to walk, you know, a certain distance without stopping and to be pretty active throughout the day. And, and often you're more busy in any given period of time in class than you will be at home because you have so much to learn. There's, there's, you're working with your guide dog, you're having lectures and learning the, the practical theory behind how your dog is trained and what you're doing. You're eating communal meals, which is really fun, especially if you live by yourself. I didn't want to come home from guide dog school because I live alone. So I was like, oh, cool. I have, I have people to eat with every, every meal. And you often make really good friends at, at class. Um, it can be really intense. So sometimes, just like when you have any group of people living together in a small space, um, it can be a little testy at times. But sometimes you're very, very lucky and you meet some amazing people that you become very close with. And in the last time I was in class, I made friends who I am still very, very close to. And we emailed almost every day for the first year after we got home because we just connected so, so, so intensely during that period of time. Um, so there's all these things pinwheeling through your head as you're waiting to get your guide dog. And then you start thinking, well, what is my dog going to be like? Because you're often not told until very close to getting to class anything about your dog. And even if you are told anything, it might only be that, you know, your dog's going to be a boy or your dog's going to be a girl, but you might not even know that until you get to class. And so as class gets closer and you start to have all the other things put into place. Okay. So, you know, these are the, this is how the dog is going to integrate into my life into my household into my family and, and immediate friends you've prepared your co-workers that when the dog comes home it's going to be you know off when a dog first comes home and, and and as i've mentioned many times on the show when a dog is working it needs to be totally ignored well that can be really hard when you introduce a dog into a bunch of colleagues who love dogs or family members who love dogs i work with people who love dogs they're very very good about ignoring my dog when he's working but it's it's not easy and they have to, you know, they, ha I, they have to really think about it, especially because he happens to be a flirt. So he tries to flirt with them. Um, sometimes there's resistance. Well, what do you mean we can't pet your dog? What do you mean we can't interact with your dog? It's a dog. We love dogs. So sometimes there has to be some education that goes on. But as you get closer and closer to that day when you're going to class, more and more you think about what is my dog going to be? Is it going to be a boy or a girl? Is it going to be a lab? Is it going to be black or yellow? What's its name going to be? And it's, it's very exciting and nerve wracking all at once because you just have no idea. And it's, it, it's such a sense of impending, um, joy. 
and yet you, you just want to know you're sort of like jumping out of your skin like oh what's my dog going to be like what am i is it, am i going to like the name which is of course a very silly thing because the name is not the important thing but as class gets closer that's all you can think about what if i don't like the name what will i do and then you start thinking up names that you would like that you might you know decide to call your dog if you don't like the name it has um but these are all really important things that have to go on to be emotionally ready. All of this is complicated and compounded if this is not your first dog. So once you've had your first dog, you now have the experience, you've been to class, but now you have the added emotional situation of retiring a dog and getting a successor dog. And so on top of all these other things that you're thinking about, you're thinking about, well, will this next dog work as well as the last dog? Will I like it as much? Will I feel as bonded to it? How will I ever bond with a new dog when I have given my heart and my soul and my trust to this current dog and now this dog is retired and I've dealt with that unbelievably difficult experience how will I ever allow myself to love and trust another guide dog? Because quite frankly, it's just too painful. I'm not going to do it. So my decision with my second dog was that I wouldn't love her. I would like her and I would work her and I would take very good care of her, but I was absolutely not going to care because caring was too much. It hurt too much when a dog retired. So I wasn't going to care. So that was my plan. And I was very determined to make that happen. And so I got my second dog, my first successor dog, and she was wonderful and sweet and smart and a great worker. And I, for about a week, made myself believe that I wasn't going to care. And then one night we were sitting down and I was petting her and it was like, I, I actually felt, people talk about falling in love and I never really had that sense of like literally falling, but I was petting her and I felt like, I just felt this inside of me, this, this, this sense of like, and I was like, oops, I care. <laughs> oh, well, that didn't work. Um, and so, and I know that sounds very silly, but really it's so hard to, to give the kind of trust to a guide dog that you have to give to make that partnership work to then have to do it again and again and again. It's so hard. And so I thought that first time I had the good answer is that I just wouldn't care, but that doesn't work. Um, one of the wonderful things about working with a guide dog program is that if you are coming to school or class to get a successor dog, there's a lot of support both from classmates who are doing the same thing, from instructors who know how difficult it is because they are you know, they, they certainly know from, from dealing with other students who are doing it. And there's often a social worker or, or um, support peer counselor who can talk to you about the feelings, the emotions that you're having, because it can be very confusing here. You, you want to love and respect and work with this new, with this new dog, but you have all these feelings for the, for the dog that just retired and it can get very messy. It's very emotionally messy and, and having support and being allowed to say all the things that you're feeling can be really helpful, especially if you're talking to another guide dog user who's going through the same thing. Because while they may not feel exactly the same way you do, they're experiencing the same thing. They're there getting a successor dog. And that can be um, really, really healing to have other people to talk to. There are some fun things that happen at um, when you first get to, to guide dog class. And still, we're still waiting. So here I've gotten to class. And it, I'm going to refer to going to class because in the guide dog program that I graduated from, we do go to class. There are, there are guide dog schools that come to you. But... In this, in this particular uh, moment, I'm talking about going to class. So you get to class and you meet your, your classmates and you, you're in your room and you've, you've probably been there for a day and you've, you've worked with the instructors and you've had a few meals. And now it's one of the most exciting things that will ever happen. It's dog day. And dog day is when you get issued your guide dog. So now all the waiting, all the preparing, all the mobility lessons, all, all of it, has come to you sitting on your bed waiting for your instructor to come into your room. And as you hear them walking down the hall and you hear the clickety clickety click of the, of the toenails, here comes this dog who started as a little tiny puppy and grew up with its siblings until it was about 10, eight weeks old. And then it went to a puppy raising home and it learned all those things that made it be a good citizen and learn about the, 
the, the world it's going to work in. And then it came to Guide Dog program and it learned all about being in a harness. And all of that culminates in this walk that the instructor makes as they come walking down the hall. And they come and, and, and you hear them because there's only so many instructors. So not everyone gets their dog at exactly the same time. And you wait and, and you hear them coming and then they go to the next room. And you're like, oh, it's not me yet. And then they go by to the other room. And you're like, oh, it's not me yet. When am I going to get my dog? And then they come to your door and there's this little tap on the door. And they walk in and they say, Andrea, I have here Juno. And that's not any real dog's name. Uh, Juno is the fake practice guide dog that everybody uses. So everybody in the world who's got a guide dog has probably worked Juno because Juno is everybody's practice guide dog. I have here Juno. Juno is a light yellow male Labrador and he's pretty big and he's pretty silly and he's going to, I'm going to let, I'm going to take off the leash and he's going to come on over there and say hello to you. And then you hear this scrabble, scrabble, scrabble. And then there's a big dog in your world, in your lap, in your face, kissing you and, and, and it starts, it starts that, that amazing thing where you go, oh my gosh, this is real. All this work and all this thinking and all this agonizing about, is this the right choice? And did I do the right thing? And will this work? And will I be a good match has come to this moment when your arms are full of this new dog. And all you know is that its name is Juno and it's a boy and it's yellow. And it clearly likes you. Of course, part of why it likes you is because you have cookies in your pocket. Um, but that's not the whole reason. And that starts the odyssey that is guide dog class and guide dog training. And from that moment on at guide dog school, you are fully responsible for your dog. You feed them, you groom them just like you do at home. They sleep in your room. They are at every, they're with you 24 seven. And it's one of the wonderful things about class is that there's nothing else going on. You're not home paying your bills and dealing with your neighbors and worrying about any of the, you're not at work. You're at school completely focused on this new relationship. When my, gram, when my grandma talks about having babies, of which she had two, um, my, my mom and my aunt, um, she talks about like being in the hospital for a week and just being able to, to you know, practice being a mom and spending time with the baby. And of course, now you're lucky if you're in the hospital for like 24 hours. So that was a, an experience that people used to have of really some, some focused time on just them and their baby without being ensconced in their home in their regular world. That's what class gives you is this wonderful bubble of time when it's just you and your dog and really focused on learning and practicing and bonding before you go immerse yourself back into your world. And training is every day, except usually there's one day off a week. It's usually Sunday. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty much 24 seven, not that you're always training, but when you go to, when you go to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're practicing being in a restaurant with your dog. When you're going to a lecture, you're practicing being in a room with multiple dogs and you know, it's a, it's like a living room. So it's like being in a doctor's waiting room or something like that. You're sitting on couches. Your dog is quietly sitting next to you. When you're out and about actually actively training with your instructor, you're in all kinds of environments, quiet neighborhoods and busy cities and riding light rail and going into malls and using escalators and doing all the things, practicing all the things that you'll be doing when you're, when you're back in your home environment. When you're in your room at night and it's just you and your dog, you're really getting to understand what does my dog like to do? How do they like to play? What toys do they like? How sneaky are they? Are they really good at being really quiet and sneaking over there and doing something I don't want them to do? Or are they really sort of noisy and it doesn't matter what they're doing, I know exactly what they're up to. So in those two weeks or three weeks that you're in class, you're learning so much about yourself and your dog and yourselves as a team. And that is why I called this series Person and Pup to Partners, because that's the goal when a blind person makes that first inquiry to a guide dog school or that first inquiry to a mobility instructor and a puppy first goes home, is first born and goes home to its puppy raising home. All of that is a 15 to 18 month process that brings the two together. And what you end up with is this, a person and a dog who have been deemed to be a good match. And match is important because if you have a dog that absolutely hates the morning, and you have someone who goes to work at six in the morning, the dog will do the work, but they're not going to be happy. And if you have a dog that really wants to go to bed at seven o'clock at night and you put them with a, you know, jazz singer, 
who doesn't start their day until seven o'clock at night, again, the dog will do the work, but they're not gonna be happy. Now those are simple sort of overviews, but if you think about spending more time with this living creature than you do with any other living thing in your world, 20, you're, you're with your guide dog more than any human, you wanna make sure that you guys ha are compatible. If you are a person who works in a building where there are lots and lots and lots of tours of small children and your dog doesn't particularly like being around small children, well, that's not a good match. If you are a person who travels all the time for work and you have a dog who really would prefer to be in a similar environment all the time, they really like it when things are, are regular. They like to go to the same places and do the same things. That's not a good match. So when the guide dog school is looking at the dogs that they have and they're looking at the applicants that they have, they really are thinking ahead to what is the lifestyle that this guide dog is going to be living in. Are they living in the desert? Are they living in a place where, where it's very, very cold? Are they living in a place where there's all kinds of rain? My dog would be terrible if it lived in a place where it rained all the time because he doesn't like to do anything when it's raining. He doesn't like to go potty. He would rather not work if he didn't have to. So he would have been a very bad dog to place in some place that it rains all the time. Um, they will do their work. I'm not saying that, but trying to find a good match is really important. And so this is, this is, the, this is the process. This is the process that brings a puppy to adulthood as a guide and a person from inexperienced traveler to competent cane traveler to ready for guide dog school to guide dog human partner. And it's an incredible journey. It involves puppy raisers and trainers. It involves volunteers. It involves mobility instructors and the supportive family and donors to the schools. It's huge. It's epic. But what the end result is beyond words. I have struggled for believe it or not, 30 years that I've been working guide dogs to try to come up with adequate words to describe what it is to, to hold the harness in my hand and to walk through the world as part of this team. It's, it's powerful. It's empowering. It's unbelievable, indescribable. And it's as everyday to me as seeing is for anyone who sees. And it's as amazing and out of this world and un believable every day as it would be to be able to go to the moon every day and come back. That's the, that's the polarity of having a guide dog. It's regular and routine and every day. And at the same time, it's remarkable and marvelous and indescribable. And so that's, that's what that is. And this is why I've wanted to share this experience because it's so, so important. That's why this series has been so exciting to me. Now that you've learned about how the puppy becomes a grown-up guide dog and how the blind person gets their skills in an appropriate fashion to be able to be partnered with a guide dog, there's not a lot more to say about that. But since I really like having a series, I can't be done yet, of course. There's a couple of other things that happen. Sometimes a guide, sometimes a dog doesn't make it to be a guide dog. That's not what their job is going to be. So next time we're going to talk to people who have dogs that were career changed. They did not become guide dogs, but they have another job. And that job might be to be a pet or that might, job might be to be a service to some other, uh, in some other type of service. And then there's also other people and their perspectives on how the guide dog has changed their life. And we haven't even had a chance to talk about that yet, how the guide dog has changed my life in so many ways and other people too. So I'm gonna get very brave and do something I've never done before on my show, which is to have a panel discussion with like four guests and me, which is gonna be really cool, I hope. I hope I'm successful at that. So that is what this is about, is learning the whole picture from puppy to guide dog to what happens if I can't become a guide dog to why did I choose to have a guide dog. I wanna thank you so much for tuning in tonight and, and thank you for being on this journey with me to explain about what the most important thing in my life, which is to be a guide dog handler this is, as you see it, a blind woman's view. Excuse me, as I see it, a blind woman's view. And I really appreciate your tuning in tonight. Have a great month.